I am Martin Luther King Jr. is the title of the book. And there's a, a drawing of him. I am Martin Luther King Jr. And you see, he's kind of standing. Where, where, can you see where he's standing? Yeah, where, what is that? Go see, how about you, honey? A church. That's a church, yeah. And that, we're going to learn why he's in a church. When I was little, I used to get into a lot of accidents. One day, my little brother hit me in the head with a baseball bat. Ooh, wow. Two other times, I mistakenly got knocked over by a car. Another day, I tumbled over our banister, then bounced through an open door into the basement. So this is him, this is him bouncing that, down the banister, and he says, Whoa, amazing fall. You okay? Oh, I'm okay, he's saying. No matter how many times I fell, I kept getting back up. Even before I could read, I knew I liked books. My dad always talked about how many I kept, uh, how I kept a lot of uh, books uh, around me. I used to tell, uh, I used to tell my parents, there's a, there's a power in words. Big words were in my future. So he learned a lot about words from reading. And he says, when I grow up, I'm going to uh, get me some big words. That's kind of funny, isn't it? You're going to hear why that's so important. When I was six years old, one of my best friends was a boy whose father owned a store across the street. And so, my friend was white. I was black. It didn't matter to us. We would play games and we have fun together. Tag, you're it. No, you're it. No, you're it. No, you're it. So they played. But when we started going to school, everything changed. He went to a school where all the kids were white. I went to a school where all the kids were black. Soon after, he told me, I, uh, he told me, and what he says is, I can't play with you anymore. He, and and uh, Martin Luther King said, why? My dad said so. He doesn't want us being friends. But why? You're one of my best friends, aren't you? Aren't you? And there he's standing by himself as his friend walks down the street. I didn't understand. It didn't make sense. So he lost his best friend because his best friend was white and he was black. At dinner, my parents explained, it's because you're black and he's white. I was so mad that day. How could someone treat me differently just because of the color of my skin? But my parents told me to do the op. I was, and then he was so mad. And then he says, I wanted to hate my friend and his father. He was pretty upset. But my parents told me to do the opposite, that I should love my friend, even though he hurt me. They taught me that it's better to have more love in your life than more hate. Then my mother taught me one of the most important lessons of all. And so here she is. She says, you are as good as anyone. You must never feel that you are less than anyone else. So that's what his mom told Martin Luther King. I wanted to believe it, but every day I saw the opposite. I saw you could be treated unfairly just because of the color of your skin. If you were white, you went to a good school with great playgrounds and plenty of books. If you were black, your school was small, some, sometimes with no desks or even windows. So check it out, a playground. And these are the white kids. And then this is, check it out. Where's the playground? So they were treated differently because of the color of their skin. It wasn't just the schools. Black people had to use different water fountains, different elevators, even different bathrooms. In fact, 
on a hot day when everyone wanted ice cream. If you were white, you could sit at the counter and eat it from a nice dish. But since I was black, if they served me at all, it was through a side window, and they put my ice cream in a flimsy little paper club, a paper cup. And so this is a picture of it, of the ice cream store. And this is ice, this is ice, this ice cream is perfect. The kids inside are saying, this ice cream is melted. Little Martin Luther King is saying. It got worse when I was, a, when I was 14. So this was when he was pretty little. So when he was 14, he says it, it got worse. I had just won a speech competition. My speech was about being fair to all people. I was so excited. Then on the bus ride home, a few white people got on the bus. At first, uh, then it says here, you need, to, uh, you need to get up and give your seat to the white people. At first, I stayed put. I didn't, it didn't seem fair. But my teacher convinced me to, to move. We spent the rest of the ride standing and getting tossed in every direction. It was the angriest I had ever been. Every day, this is white life. This is white, what life was like. Black people were treated terribly and the only question was, what could I do about it? At the age of 15, I started college. By 19, I became a minister. Remember the first picture we saw? He was standing in a church. He became a minister and entered seminary school to study religion. And what this says here, he's talking to this fellow here. Over those years, I read the works of Henry David Thoreau and Mahat. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Thoreau taught me about civil disobedience, how an evil system could be changed without violence. Gandhi opened my mind to the power of nonviolence, nonviolent resistance. What's that? Love, love. It's using, uh, it's using love and peaceful methods. Uh, and peaceful methods to change unfair things in society. So do you understand what that means? So you might be really angry and you want to do something, but instead of getting real angry, you have more love in your heart than you have, you know, hate. And you use that. You, you use peace. You use reason. It was a lesson I wanted to share with everyone. In no time at all, I got my chance. In Alabama, a black woman named Rosa Parks was told to give up her bus seat to a white man. It was just like what happened to me. But unlike me, Mrs. Parks refused. She was arrested. Eve, early the next morning, I got a phone call from a local community leader. And here's the conversation. It's time to take a stand. We should boycott the buses. That, uh, that let's see, we, we need to boycott the buses so everyone knows that we won't accept this treatment anymore. You know, that's not going to be easy. Do not ask if it's easy, ask if it's right. So you see, so they had that conversation. It was just like throw taught. Instead of using violence to protest and unfair, unfair rules, black people would use peaceful methods. We would not ride public buses. Without our money, the bus companies would go out of business. Now the only question was, would it work? So they weren't going to go out and cause a bunch of trouble and, you know, maybe, you know, have fist fights or anything like that. They just were going to stop riding the buses and put that pressure on the bus system to change their rules. On the first day of the protest, my wife called me uh, to the window. The buses are all empty. It's working, he said. We had to keep going. As the head of the bus boycott, I gave one of the most important speeches of my life. So you see where he is? He's in his church. Yeah, he's the minister. The room was packed. Camera crews were filming. I had only 20 minutes to prepare. I didn't use notes. But by speaking from my heart, I found out how big words can be. 
and he what he says here we are determined here in Montgomery to work and fight until justice runs down like water and the righteousness and righteousness like the mighty stream when the history books are written in the future somebody will have to say there lived a race of people a black people who had the moral courage to stand up for their rights so that was a pretty important speech that he gave the police put me in jail they put him in jail saying he was breaking the law other folks bombed his house but instead of using his fist he kept using calm so boy that's that takes a lot of courage when you're thrown in jail and you're somebody throws a bomb at your house and yet you don't respond negatively you try to keep calm and what these folks are saying here is don't you want to fight back and he says I'm a man of of nonviolence and I know that I do not stand alone and then this person is saying we are with you all the way reverend if no one rides these buses we'll go out of business that's what the bus guy is saying and then this person is saying oh so you're finally getting that huh so they're making their point that was only the beginning soon our peaceful protests sparked other peaceful protests at lunch counters college students organized sit-ins where they would not stop until everyone could eat together our methods of nonviolence were very powerful i was invited to meet with the president in the white house but sometimes the hardest problems were right at home and what this says right here this is a his daughter daddy look an amusement park please can we go and martin says i'm sorry yoki we can't fun town is not open to black people seeing my daughter cry was one of the most painful moments of my life it only made me work harder for change so and do you understand the lunch counter situation mm -hmm. you know where they had a lunch counter and only white people could sit there so these black college students would go in and sit there and sometimes they got arrested sometimes they had food poured on poured over them they were treated pretty badly but they needed to make the point nonviolently that they had every right to sit at that lunch counter was it easy absolutely not during our protest one protest in Birmingham Alabama the police again arrested me and locked me in a dark jail cell that only that had only one window and then he's sitting here writing and he said someone slipped me a newspaper in which white religious leaders had written an article calling us lawbreakers someone then snuck me a pen in that jail cell i wrote my own response in the margins of the newspaper and even on toilet paper when my letter from birmingham jail was soon published my letter from birmingham jail was soon published as a pamphlet then it was in magazines and newspapers today it has been read by millions of people like i said it is amazing how big words can be our message was so important even kids your age joined us in Birmingham and during the children's crusade more than 1000 kids some as young as 6 years old showed up to march the first day the police arrested 900 of them the next day 2500 children showed up and ready to go to jail that's pretty strong commitment don't you think going to jail is not fun this was our finest hour enraged that we were not giving up the chief of police told the firemen to spray the children with water hoses and attack them with dogs they thought it would stop us but instead as the whole country watched on tv what they were doing to our children it was a wake-up call for the nation's conscience so what they're saying here is how can they treat little kids like that that's not right we need to help them 
So it was waking up the nation, because not everybody lived in, in these kind of populations. Ninety days later, the rules began to change. Now blacks and whites in Birmingham were using the same lunch counters, water fountains, and restrooms. You could feel it in the air. So they were making progress, weren't they? More change was coming. Freedom was contagious. By the summer of 1963, an estimated one million Americans held their own protests in cities across the country. A man named A. Philip Randolph suggested a massive march. And what they're saying here is, if we march together peacefully, they won't be able to ignore us. Together, we can convince Congress and the president to pass laws so that no one in America can treat people differently based on the color of their skin. I like the idea where we should, where should we have this march? There's only one place, this person says. Where do you think they have the march? Any idea? Huh? No, they know. Anybody? Yeah? Washington, D.C.? I think you're very right. It was in the monument. There you go. There you go. You are very good for you. People came from almost every state. They came in nearly every form of transportation. They even took work off. They did not get paid just to be there. Old people, young people, black people, white people, even children like you. They all came to Washington, D.C., gathering in a righteous army. Why'd they do that? because they wanted a change, and they knew the surest way to change the world is to stand together. So what this says here, I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. And it was, boy, there were people all up and down the big mall area in Washington, D.C., and there's the Lincoln Memorial right there. On August 28th, 1963, I stood at a podium and I spoke what some later called my biggest words of all, March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that one day little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with the little girls, little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. Let freedom ring from every mountainside. Let freedom ring. Have you ever heard that whole speech? It's really powerful. Yeah, it's very powerful. In fact, I've been to the Washington Monument, and they actually have a mark where Martin Luther King stood to give that speech. And you can stand right where he stood when he gave that speech. After the March on Washington, the President and Congress passed new laws for civil rights. But that didn't mean our work was done. Indeed, our greatest battle was still to come. It began with 600 activists as they tried to walk 54 miles uh, from Selma, Alabama to the state capital in Montgomery. Back then, there were rules that stopped black people from voting. If you wanted to change the law, you have to be able to vote for new people who make the laws. So what they're saying here, they're crossing the bridge here, and the people are saying, we're marching to tell the governor we want voting rights. This brutality must end. No matter what, no matter what, don't let them pass. So that's what the police are saying. And there the, the, the protesters are saying this brutality has got to end. We want the right to be able to vote and participate. The police had billy clubs and tear gas. They attacked our groups and they knocked many people down. But as I learned so long ago, you don't have to get back up. You, you, you do have to get back up, I'm sorry. You have to get right back up. No matter how hard they hit us, we remained peaceful. Still, we didn't get through. So they didn't fight back. 
They just stood, stood their ground. Two days later, we tried again. Now there was 2,500 of us. And they're saying here, we will get to Montgomery. No, you won't, they're saying. I promise you won't. So there was a real standoff. Once again, we tried. Once again, we did not get through. We, but we did not give up. What, what, do you, what do you think? What do you think? It was Sunday, March 21st, 1965. Our third try. Now we had 8,000 people with us. And they're all saying, we're on the move. We shall overcome. Check out the crowd. Black, white, Christian Jews all standing together. For two days we marched. Rain could not stop us. The world was watching. The White House was too. President Johnson even sent troops to protect us. Exhaust, exhaustion could not stop us. They were very tired after all those days of trying to get across the bridge and march. As we reached Montgomery, Alabama, tears were shed, but this time they were tears of joy. In my life, people tried to tell me I wasn't as good as they were just because of the color of my skin. When someone hurts you like that, it can be tempting to hurt them back. You must refuse. When someone shows you hate, show them love. When someone shows you violence, show them kindness. To reach our goals, we must walk Path, the path of peace. We must lock arms with our brothers and sisters. We must march together. When we do, our voices will be heard and freedom will reign. And so what they're saying here is, remember uh, Fun Town Amusement Park? Its doors eventually became open to black people and Dr. King got to take his daughter there. Did you know that he was the youngest person to win the Nobel Peace Prize? Just 35 years old. He donated the prize money to the Civil Rights Movement. He said that the prize was the work of many others, many other unsung heroes. So when you win the Nobel Peace, Peace Prize, you get a big pile of money. If it was today, you'd get it. I think that's true. I don't know how much money he got, but it was worth a lot of money back then, too. And he gave that to the civil rights movement. He fought against poverty, too. There's even a national holiday for him on the third Monday of every January. So we'll be celebrating that next Monday. Only Washington and Lincoln get a day like that, and they share theirs. It's a day to remember how far we've come and how much more work there is to do. And that's the Martin Luther King Memorial. That's what it looks like. I've had a chance to see it. It's really something else. I'm Martin Luther King Jr. I stand for peace. I stand for justice. I stand to help others. I stand as proof that no matter how hard the struggle, we must fight for what is right and work to change what is wrong. Whatever struggle you face, no matter how hard it gets, you must always move forward. I'm proof of this. If we rise up, if we stand together, if we remain united, nothing can stop our dreams. There's that big speech in, at the monument. And here's pictures. The time is always right to do right. That's one of his, that's one of his statements. This is a picture from the March on Washington. This is a picture of him and his family. And there's a timeline here, and it's pretty small print, but it just kind of goes to show he was born in Atlanta, Georgia, January 15th, 1929. He graduated from Morehouse College in 1948. In 1951, graduates from uh, Crozier Theological Seminary, June 18th, 1953, he marries his wife, Coretta Scott King. In 1955, he leads the Montgomery bus boycott, and that was in 1955 and 1956. So we read about that. He writes the letter from Birmingham jail, April 16th, 1963. August 28th, 1963, he made his famous speech in Washington, I have a dream. December 10th, 1964, he receives the Nobel Peace Prize. March 21st through the 25th, 1965, the uh, Selma to Montgomery March was where they tried to cross the bridge and had a hard time doing it. 
April 4th, 1968, in Memphis, Tennessee, he was assassinated. 1986, Martin Luther King Jr. Day was first observed. So that gives you an idea of what we're going to be celebrating next Monday, this man. What do you think? Pretty, pretty strong guy. Do you, did you ever think, I mean, sometimes when people treat you wrong, what do you want to do usually? Attack them. Attack them. You want to, yeah. I mean, that's kind of human nature. But he was trying to teach people the way to best do it was to, to treat, you know, if they show you hate, what do you do? Show them love. You show them love. Yeah. And that's hard to do. But maybe it's really the way we need to do things. What do you think?